We're knocking down these videos like a bank of drop targets. That's what we'll be talking about today in video seven. Setting up targets is just a little bit more involved than the rest of the objects, so we're dedicating a whole video to it. First, I'll tell you why targets are different, and then I'll describe how to set up the Rothbauer target scripts, which improves both the animations and the physics responses of the targets in VPX. First, let me demonstrate why targets are different. We'll use our old friend Switch 20, which is the combo target on the left side of Godzilla. For demonstration purposes, I created an animate subroutine for Switch 20. Whenever the subroutine is called, I'll output some text to the debug window. And you'll see that when the target is not visible, the animate subroutine just won't be called. When it is visible, it will be called. But for projects that use VLM bake maps and light maps, the target itself will always be set to be invisible. So in that case, the animate subroutine is basically useless. Let me show you what I mean. First, let's set this to visible. So if I press D, it opens the debug window. And I'm just going to ball control into the switch. All right, that worked. I'll make it invisible and try again. Let's see what happens. So animate is not being called. The reason animate is not called when the switch is invisible is for some backwards compatibility reasons. I haven't fully looked into it, but I don't think it's going to change. To solve this problem, we're going to use the Rothbauer stand-up target code. That will handle the animation of the stand-up targets and add a little realism to the physics. Before we get into the script, I'll just describe the table objects that you'll need to get this working. And what I typically do is I'll set up all the table objects first, and then I'll go and add the script and update the script to make it all work. So let's do a search on switch 20 and filter on that just to see what we've got going here. <clears throat> so the first thing you'll need is the target itself. This is just a, a regular VPX target. Um, you're going to want it to be invisible, of course. For the physics settings, you'll need to make sure it's collidable. And definitely use the NFOSI physics material. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole NFOSI setup. That's a whole other topic. But let's just double check that. The next thing you'll need is this object here, which I'm calling the stand-up blocker. It's just a primitive, um, it's rectangular primitive that's tilted back slightly. This also needs to be collidable and have the target's material applied. And finally, you're going to need the, um, the visual parts of the target. So the bake map and all the light maps. Before we go any further, I'm just going to make this ST blocker visible and I'll show you what it looks like inside the game. So here's an important point. Uh, this pink thing is the ST blocker. If you copy this from other games, it's likely that it's going to be taller than what's shown here. In Godzilla, I had originally had an issue where when the ball was coming down this ramp, it was actually interacting with this ST blocker because it was too tall and it was poking up into the ramp area. So just something to be aware of that when you copy and paste this from other tables, it typically comes in a little bit taller. Moving into the script setup, um, what I would suggest is that you just copy and paste the entire script from this table or some other table. Once you've copied the script in, we'll need to update it to um, create variables for each stand-up target in the table. I usually name the variables uh, with the 
number associated with the target index that's used by the ROM. So like switch 20 would be defined as ST20. And this ST20 is an instance of the stand-up target class. The stand-up target class contains a bunch of properties of the stand-up target that we'll be using throughout the script. There are four arguments you need to pass into the creation of that object. The first one is the target object itself. So this would be, in the case of switch 20, it's this, this target. The second argument is the bake map for that switch. The third argument is the ROM number. And the last, just set as a zero, um, it's going to be used by the script for animation purposes. Once those variables are defined, you'll need to make sure that you include all of them in the ST array. Now we can scroll past all these functions. You don't need to modify any of this. One thing I'll point out is that if you're only using stand-up targets in a table, then you'll need to make sure you have this DT ball physics subroutine included. Typically, this comes along with the drop target scripts. Godzilla has no drop targets. I had to make a copy of this subroutine and paste it into the script separately. But normally, this would just come along with the drop targets. At the bottom is the update stand-up target subroutine. So the script above um, modifies the bake map trans y property, and this subroutine copies that information to the light maps of each target. So you'll need to make sure that you update this to include all of the targets. So once you have all of that set up, there's a couple other things throughout the script you'll need to add. First of all, you'll have to include this update standup target subroutine and another call in a timer that gets called once every 10 milliseconds. Do a search on this. So I have a game timer. Um, in all the scripts that I set up, I use two main timers. One I call the game timer, which is called every 10 milliseconds. And then another I call the frame timer, which is called once per frame. I organize a lot of my timer-based subroutines in this way just because I think it's clean. So in the game timer, which gets called once every 10 milliseconds, I have the update standup targets. But just above that, I have the do st anim subroutine call. So first, do the animation of the bake map. That's what this does. And then update the position of the light maps based on the bake map animation. And the very last thing you'll need to do in the script is include this st hit subroutine call within the target hit subroutines. So for switch 20, whenever that is hit, we call st hit 20. This will initiate the animation. In order for the Roth code to work correctly, you need to have the local frame in Blender set up properly. So the y-axis needs to be normal to the face of the target, but pointed in the direction the ball would hit the target. x-axis along the face of the target, and z-axis straight up. Note, you should not have the use obj pose checkbox checked. All right, let's move on to drop targets. Well, since Godzilla doesn't have any, let's go back to Haunted House. In Haunted House, there's drop targets on the upper playfield and in the basement. Um, but let's take a look at the upper playfield. Okay, I'm just going to zoom in to the uh, drop target bank in the upper playfield. So you'll notice that there's two walls here for each drop target. We're looking at switch 02. I'm going to filter on that. Switch 02 has this main wall here, it's collidable, can drop, has the drop target physics material applied to it. Same thing with the wall right behind it, which I call switch 02A. 
In addition to these walls, each drop target will have its bake map and its light maps. Coming over to the script, it's going to be similar to how we set up the stand-up target code. First thing I would do is copy everything from a table like this one or a similar one. Then you'll need to define a variable for each drop target. Then for each drop target variable, you'll need to create a new instance of the drop target class. And in this case, we'll be passing six arguments into the class init function. First object is the primary target wall. So that would be the wall that sits in front, and that's the wall that's going to be hit first by the ball. Second object is the secondary target wall. Then comes the bake map for the target. This is the ROM switch number. This number is a reserved value that's used by the animation subroutines. And this is the is dropped boolean. So if you ever need to check if a target is dropped or it's not dropped, you can query the is dropped property of that drop target. So once you've set up all of these instances of the drop target class, you'll need to make sure that they're all included in the DT array. And similar to the standup target code, we have an update drop target subroutine. This subroutine is called in a timer and it updates the properties of the light maps for each drop target based on the properties of its associated bake map. And the bake map properties are updated by the animation subroutines themselves. So this gets called in the timer. I'm calling it within the game timer and it gets called after the do DT anim subroutine is called. In Haunted House, at the top here, you'll see the script related to the ROM call that raises all of the drop targets in the upper and the lower play fields. So upper drops up and lower drops up. Just so you know, if we do a search on that, you'll see that those two subroutines are defined to be called by the sole callback array. So this is the interface between the ROM and the script. When the ROM commands the upper drop targets to be raised, we need to call the DT raise subroutine for each of those drop targets. And here we're also calling the uh, sound effect that's associated with the drop targets raising. And I'll get into this in just a minute, but um, in Haunted House, we've got drop target shadows being animated as well. So similar setup for the lower drop targets. Whenever a drop target wall is hit, we want to initiate the animation of that hit. So we have to call DT hit and pass in the ROM index of that drop target. Before I describe what the drop target shadow animation is all about, let's just take a look at them. Okay, here we are on the upper play field. You might barely be able to see it, but there are shadows in front of each drop target. If I knock them all down, you can see that they go away. And when they pop back up, the shadows show up again. <laughs> okay. In VPX, to get these drop target shadows to work, first of all, you have to create the shadow images and import them into VPX. And then put those images onto flashers. So in Haunted House, let's show the shadows layer. You can see here that each shadow image is placed onto a flasher and I'm showing the image in the editor. So that's why you can see all of them. 
you can render these shadows using Blender, but in this case, I actually just created these in Photoshop. It doesn't have to be perfect uh, because they're pretty subtle, but um, you could do it either way. And if you wanted to do it in Blender, I have a video on the VPW YouTube channel talking about how to do that. I think it's called How to Render Playfield Shadows. So once you have these images and you put them into flashers, name the flashers something meaningful and then come into the collections manager and create a collection. In this case, I called it DT shadows. We'll use this collection throughout the code. For example, whenever a drop target drops, this DT action subroutine is called. You pass into it the switch index. So for example, when switch 02 drops, we're going to make the first element in that collection not visible, basically hiding the shadow. Coming up to when the drop targets are raised, you can see that we loop through the DT shadows collection and make all the shadows visible again. So I would recommend doing a search on DT shadows in the script and just seeing where the shadows are being handled. Just like stand up targets, the drop target local frame in Blender has to be set up correctly and it's the same setup. Y axis normal to the face but pointed in the direction the ball would hit the target. X axis along the face and Z axis straight up. For a drop target, it's important that you actually set the origin below the play field around the axis that you want the target to rotate when the ball hits the face. Because when the ball hits the face, the code is set up to actually tilt the target backwards around this axis. Again, you do not want to have use obj pose checked. You do want to have hide from others checked. That way the drop target shadows are not rendered on the play field. And there's one more thing I want to point out before we wrap up drop targets. And that's that in the original haunted house table that we completely updated, it used the CVPM drop target class. When you upgrade the drop target code to use the Roth approach, you will need to completely eliminate all the CVPM drop target stuff. So to do that, I would recommend finding where they're defined, which is usually in the table and knit subroutine, and then just search for the, uh, the variable that is assigned to that object. And wherever the variable shows up, you know you'll need to um, modify that code. We made it through all the movable stuff, all right. All the main VLM topics have really been covered by now. And we'll get into more of the supporting kind of topics. So in the next video, we'll talk about how to adjust the overall room brightness and how to dynamically adjust the ball brightness in various parts of the table and as the room lighting changes. See you then.